Fantastic. So should I start, Craig? Yes, please. Oh, okay. Thank you, Craig, and for the introduction and the invitation. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm glad, very glad to be here today, this morning, to tell you about uh, how uh, we have done studies on coastal adaptation, resiliency issues, uh, anticipating the future more intense storms and sea level rise. So I'm not a sea level scientist, as most of you who presented before are. Well, we are on the receiving end of uh, the climate predictions on future storms and sea level rise in the 21st century. So what I want to talk about is the impact of what you do on the coastal uh, communities, coastal adaptation and resilience planning. And the focus today is on a, a small tidal marsh, uh, not far from you all. It's up uh, 15 minutes up from New York City along Hudson River, the place called Piermont Marsh. And uh, we want to look at the value of coastal wetlands for protecting coastal communities from flood and wave induced structural loss in the changing climate. And Piermont is the focus of the study uh, because it was uh, hit by Hurricane Superstorm Sandy in 2012. And the communities witnessed that the marsh effectively reduced the damage flood damage due to Sandy. At the same time, the marsh managers were thinking about marsh restoration. Uh, and, and therefore, both parties would like to know the value of the Piermont Marsh in uh, flood protection. So this is how the project started. And we are funded by NOAA through the National Estuarine Research Reserve's Science Collaborative Program which is based, managed by University of Michigan Water Center. And so we're happy to uh, uh, acknowledge their support. Uh, but as part of the study, we also have to look into the Hurricane Sandy's impact on New Jersey coastline, as well as New York and Connecticut. So in today's talk, I'm gonna talk about uh, the two studies we've done, one on Piermont Marsh, one on New Jersey, and then looking into the future from 2020 all the way to 2100. Uh, and I want to acknowledge the multiple uh, multidisciplinary team, multi-agency multi support, and I'm gonna show their pictures later on. Uh, so here is the area view of Piermont Marsh. And this is where um, some of you like Klaus lives. Uh, let's see. It's not moving, why is it not moving? Okay, so uh, this, these are pictures of Piermont Marsh. Piermont Marsh, as you know, it's primarily made up of Phragmites, which is an invasive species. Phragmites are uh, natural in Europe and China. Uh, in fact, there's some very ancient po romantic poems in China. Uh, associated with uh, Phragmites Marsh. So uh, somehow in the US, Phragmites has been looked upon as a uh, invasive species, uh, but in Phragmites uh, dominant Piermont Marsh, you can still see a lot of wild animals and uh, birds and uh, fish utilizing this uh, marsh. And although some of the fish might not like this marsh, but apparently this is a uh, setting that's enjoyed by a lot of animals and, uh, and birds. Uh, and, but we're not gonna look into the ecosystem service value of this marsh for this other issues, uh, natural habitat or, uh, but we could look at its uh, role as a, uh, a buffer for uh, storm surge and, and, uh, and wave. So here's a picture of the Piermont Marsh and that's what you know my background looks like. Uh, 
Uh, so it looks like I'm in Piermont Marsh today. Uh, why do we look at the flood damage? And this is a uh, picture from the Congressional Budget Office report. In 2018, they estimate the US annual loss of residential properties due to hurricanes is 30 billion and flood loss is 20 billion. So flood loss is more than wind loss, right? And, uh, but then there are $20 billion unaccounted losses. Those are business loss and public sector loss is 20 billion. So total loss is 54 billion. And the residential pro, uh, flood loss therefore is about 60% of the residential loss due to wind and flood combined and 37% of the total loss of $54 billion. And so flood is very, very important. That's why we're focusing on the role of wetland for flood protection. It's also important to point out that 18% of US population, US properties have no, have, have, have flood insurance. So 82% properties do not have flood insurance. It's a very dangerously low number, even though it's a real bargain. And so uh, most of the talks you have heard in this series are focused on climate change and civil rights studies at global and regional scale. Uh, those are very, very important because we need those information, future storms and future sea level rise values to do adaptation and for coastal resilience. But the coastal adaptation is done at the local level. Therefore, we have to go to local scale, uh, understand the impact of climate change. Uh, it all started, this project all started because of Superstorm Sandy in 2012. And you can see the massive size of the storm created uh, catastrophic damage in New Jersey New York, Connecticut, the tri-state area, those are the heaviest hit states in the entire US because of huge size of 1100 miles diameter of New Jersey landfall. This is very rare landfall right near Atlantic City. Even though it's category one storm, it happened during high tide and this special track and the huge size created huge damage and therefore you can't really associate the intensity of a storm alone to the damage it causes. Uh, so this is the unique track and the red box is the area of our interest. This regional scale is our interest. Uh, this shows the track, how it changes in intensity when landfall went to Lake Erie. Uh, but our focus today is New Jersey coast as well as the Piermont, Village of, village of Piermont with uh, about 500 buildings and a Piermont marsh, a little over 200 acres. <clears throat> there's, there's other areas that are proposed as a potential restoration area by the marsh managers, Hudson River National Estuarine Research Reserve. So that's the local scale. So we're gonna cover local scale as well as the regional scale here in this study. The key questions want to be answered by this research. The stakeholders, the communities, and the marsh managers, they want to know what is the economic value of the buffering service the Piermont Marsh provide now and in the future. So we have actually added uh, New Jersey to this, and we want to know not only Piermont Marsh, but also uh, New Jersey, wetland. Uh, how would the buffering service change if the marsh gradually restored vegetation in about 40 acres of marsh in a map? And so this is the New Jersey uh, question, uh, which wasn't in the original study plan, but, and so I, uh, uh, I wanna show you the people who have contributed to this project. I uh, was the PI and uh, a couple of students worked on this project. We had ecologists, coastal engineer, modelers from University of Florida, economists from University of Miami, 
And uh, we had Tim Hall from NASA GIS. Until yesterday, he was at NASA, but now he is uh, with a private firm. Um, we have a lot of local, uh, we have other people from USGS, uh, from New York Palisades Interstate Park, uh, geophysicist Klaus Jacob was a key figure in this study, uh, end user from Village of Piermont. Um, we also had a consensus builder, Bennett Brooks, uh, really good in building consensus. We have uh, originally, Betsy Blair and then Heather Jerloff at uh, the National Estuarine Research Reserve, Reserve Manager. And we also had Emily and Sarah who contributed to this project. So we have a long list of contributors. I want to thank their support throughout this project. And also Lane, who was the project manager at University of Michigan. So uh, refresh your memory, we're looking at regional scale, regional domain, uh, where we, this domain is where we set up model, coastal model to do storm surge and wave simulation. In the large domain, uh, we use uh, something like as small as 20, 30 meter resolution to about 200 meter average uh, over, the, over the region. In the Piermont, Village in March, we use a uh, model that has four meter resolution in horizontal. And we use the 2D model here in uh, New Jersey, New York, a 3D model in Piermont, uh, simply because we do not have the detailed st structure and distribution of all the wetland in New Jersey, New York, and Connecticut. But we do have detailed information of the marsh uh, in Piermont. So this is a picture of the different types of wetland in this area. The red are the highly developed area in lower Manhattan, Long Island, you see huge area with red. These are basically with very little wetland. Uh, and here in Southern Jersey, you see evergreen forests. We have a large forest area and on the coast, we see a lot of development of New Jersey. And then we have uh, a gray area, uh, gray area, woody wetlands, these are a little further inland in New Jersey. Woody wetland, they provide some flood protection. And then you have blue area, emerging herbaceous wetlands. These are marshes, Batina marshes in Southern Jersey and Jacques Cousteau National Action Research Reserve is in this area. And so how do we, we must represent all this information in our uh, coastal surge and wave model. Um, it, as I said, we do not have the detailed structure in terms of the height and how they change, the density. Uh, uh, so we could not do a 3D model for this entire region, except in the Piermont region. So we use a two dimensional model and, you know, in two-dimensional model, we use a thing called Manning's end to represent bottom friction. And these are showing, it goes by order magnitude variation, 0.15 in the very dense area of New York City, uh, also very high Manning's end in where we have these uh, forests. Uh, Uh, and then we found the uh, coastal area. We had low manning's end because these are low marshes and they do not provide a whole lot of, a lot of, uh, lot of friction. So this is not ideal, but that's what we got. So we got to work with this. And so we, what we, a little description on the model we used for the coastal model. We use a couple search CH3D with a swan wave model, vegetation resolving. Uh, if we have vegetation structure, if we use 3D, then we can resolve the vegetation. If it's 2D, we do many then. So we have this large domain where we can run SERC or CHVD in 2D mode and plus wave watch three. Uh, and then on the regional domain boundary, we use the results of these large scale model as boundary condition to drive 
the surge and wave uh, for any for any uh, storm for any storm. Um, and so we use these models to produce probabilistic coastal inundation maps because when we do coastal resili resilience studies, we cannot just look at one storm, look at the impact of Sandy uh, in the coastal communities and how wetland reduced the damage, flood damage due to Sandy in one storm. We have to look at a large ensemble of storms. So therefore we have to create probabilistic coastal inundation maps with and without the vegetation present <clears throat> and then not figure out the value of the wetland. So we do use a uh, storm ensemble. In this case, we use the results of the North Atlantic uh, statistical hurricane model or stochastic hurricane model. This is the model Tim Hall developed and he provided a large ensemble of storms for this region. And we use the sea level rise predictions by NOAA and uh, and, um, and we use a statistical method, which I'm not gonna go into too much. And, and so basically we come up with about 300 storms uh, that we need to simulate. Uh, from there, we can develop this probabilistic flood maps. Uh, this is a little busy plot and I want to show you uh, the study bottom line is we're using uh, integ integrate dynamic models, a regional scale model, a coastal model and a local scale coastal model for Piermont and the model are indicated by yellow. So it actually start with the stochastic hurricane model, the North Atlantic hurricane model can generate a storm track for an ensemble of storms. For each of those storms, we do the large scale model simulation for New York, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut. And we feed that boundary condition into the high resolution model in Piermont, which is four meter resolution. Uh, Cause we got to use a lot of data. Green is data. Uh, we use the sea level rise scenario, marsh management scenario, sandy wind. Uh, all these data feed into this model and develop the damage, uh, develop the wave and flood, develop the damage uh, due to these flood and wave. We have to verify our model results with data during Sandy, make sure it's believable. Then we use the real building data to do economic analysis due to wave and flood and provide those information to local community so they can do resilience planning. Uh, so this is the, the overall uh, sketch of how the study is done. So first I'd like to uh, point you to a paper where you see a lot of details described here in there in the scientific reports published in, in March this year. Uh, the link will get you to the paper directly. So when we look at the role of wetlands in reducing structural loss, it's highly dependent on the storms. Uh, different storms uh, shows you different values of wetland. Uh, it also depends on the local wetland condition and the local at-risk properties. Uh, so for New Jersey, it's fairly uh, now uniform, the role of wetland in Reducing flood damage is quite different throughout the zip code. These are color coded for different zip codes and in terms of different percent reduction, of course, you, uh, you know, you can, you can reduce some, in some place uh, you can actually increase the damage uh, if the marsh is, uh, is behind the building, it's actually increased the flood damage. But generally it reduces the flood damage so how much damage did it reduce during Sandy? We found that uh, a total reduction in Sandy, it, the wetland reduced only 8% of the flood loss, okay? Uh, first, we have to verify the flood loss we calculate during Sandy, agree with the FEMA uh, uh, and FIP payouts. And then we have to do different storms. And we found out that once we do the 1%, 
flat and wave. And this is something I will explain. I know it's a tricky thing to understand. 1% flood and wave, this is really no different from the FEMA 1% flood map, flood elevation, but we actually look at the wave elevation as well. And so when we look at the 1% flood and wave, the wetland reduced 52% of the loss. So the wetland value is not a single number, it varies with the storms and it varies with the zip code, okay? So how do you, what do you do with it? And we also found that during, we specially designed a very rare black swan storm. The purpose was that we want to design a storm that hit the Piermont Marsh with a wind that parallel to the long axis of the storm of the Mars to see if it will uh, increase the buffering capacity of the Mars for search. And so during that storm, it, the wetland New Jersey reduced 26% of the flood damage. Now overall for the NFIP, it shows 3.9 billion uh, loss and we simulated about 3.6 billion loss. So they're, they're quite close uh, in terms of the, our uh, dynamic model assessment of the flood damage. And the important thing to mention is we develop a regression model, which is the relative loss, relative property loss within any zip code as a percent of the total property is a function of three things. The average wave crest. The wave crest is a combination of the flood elevation and the wave effect. Okay, so uh, it different uh, zip code by zip code and different from storm to storm and the wetland coverage, and that is based on the zip code level and the at-risk property value also changes from zip code to zip code. We developed a regression model. They, this developed regression model was based on the results of all our dynamic simulations for Sandy, for the black swan storm, for the 1% flood and wave. We developed a very good regression model with R square about 0.75. So after that, this, this was in the paper, we've been playing around with so-called artificial intelligence these days. Everybody wants to do some artificial intelligence as if a human intelligence is not, it's not sufficient. But anyway, the artificial intelligence, we produce a regression model, which is better, which is got a, we got R square up to 0.9. Uh, I'm not showing it to you here, but it may, sh may show up in the next paper. So it can point you, uh, relate these driving functions for flood loss uh, to the loss uh, more precisely and tell you which one is more important in, in driving this loss. So New Jersey coastal wetland, uh, it's interesting to, to point out that marsh is only about, uh, let's say, you know, 120,000 acres in New Jersey, but woody wetlands, these are trees, these are actually four or five times more. And not only that, it's in Ocean County where you have a lot of Spatina marsh, but also you got more woody wetlands. So apparently the marshes in New Jersey uh, not as effective as the woody wetlands uh, in uh, reducing uh, flood damage. Uh, and here, here's how we calculate the, the wetland value is that we calculate the flood and wave and, and total uh, flood loss and wave induced loss with the wetland seen there and and you see mostly due to flood loss. And then we calculate without the wetlands, we turn wetlands into open water and, and you can see the, the losses will increase uh, and more, more substantial increase in wave because marshes are more effective in dissipating wave damage. And so this is how we calculate uh, the value of a uh, of, of wetland. So now let's turn our attention to the village during Sandy. Uh, maximum wave height, maximum flood height is about 9.48 9 feet. This is at Klaus House. Uh, this is at uh, 
Hermann Pier, 9.38 feet. Uh, maximum wave is about 0.66 feet at Klaus House and 2.03 feet at Piermont uh, Pier. And there are, these are the residential structures and all the records we can find. Uh, and these properties are up, up, up very high up the hill, so they didn't have any, any damage. Okay, we, we didn't want to show that the damage because that's sensitive proprietary information. And so one question people want to ask is these, because fragmites are invasive, but they're taller and more rigid, but what if they're replaced by the native typha, which are shorter and flexible? So we did some studies to look at simulations to look at uh, the difference from these two different marshes and how they impact the flood and wave and debris. And we found that with the existing Phragmites, it doesn't really dissipate much of the flood because the peak wind was from the east and the marsh width, as you recall, is, uh, is only a few hundred meters long. It wasn't sufficient to dissipate the surge, but it was able to dissipate about two thirds of the, the wave height. Now, if you replace Phragmite with Typhi in the model simulation, this is a numerical experiment and we found the same thing, all right? Dissipate wave, but not flood. Uh, and therefore, and the flow inside the marsh were very almost zero, very slow current or one centimeter per second. Therefore, they prevented the debris that go on the Southeast side of the marsh from reaching the village. And now, but if we recognize the fact that Typhar goes through more annual variation growth cycle in May, they're very low. So if God forbid Sandy happened in May, then this Typhar would have no value in protecting the village from flood damage. And of course, when we removed the entire marsh, then uh, we couldn't have protect the village at all. So this is a, a layman's view of how it happened during Sandy with Phragmites. Wave height is significantly reduced by more than two thirds. Uh, by the time you get to the village, it's much lower. The flood height is basically the same. Uh, there's supposed to be a little more flood height here. Uh, and Typha, the results about the same. And you see the debris were blocked uh, by the marsh both Typhar and Frank Mighty. When they have no marsh and, and wave and flood would reach all the way to the village and cause a lot more damage and including the debris. So these are done by University of Michigan. They're good in doing this outreach uh, stuff. So how do we do the damage calculation? We have the 1% flood and 1% uh, wave calculator from a large ensemble of storm simulations. We've we follow the FEMA methodology. Here's a FEMA map showing you uh, how they classify the flood zones, V, E, A, E, A zones, depending on the wave height. Okay, so here is the uh, 100 year flood elevation. And then you have wave set up uh, on top of it. And so these are the wave effect decrease as you go inland. Uh, and the wave height decreases. So depending on which flood zone you are, uh, you, you include the wave height or you do not include the wave height in the damage assessment. Uh, you calculate the 1% flood and wave and you do the base flood elevation. You calculate something called wave crust. crust. And then find out every house where they are in the flood zone and calculate the damage. And we use the damage function developed by Army Corps, North Atlantic Coastal Study, next study which happened after Sandy. So this is by no means rocket science. So there are uncertainties associated with these functions. So we had to do quite a bit of uh, uh, tuning to come up with these meaningful estimate. The good thing is we have NFIP claims we can compare with. Um, 
So what happened is during Sandy, we had 41 buildings that are paid by FEMA um, and um, they're paid 3.47 million. So we focused on those 41 buildings in our simulation and we found that the loss is 3.72 million. So this that's pretty close to the FEMA number. So it's a validation our, of our flood and wave and damage analysis. So if we calculate the loss with and without the wetland being present, we found out the avoided loss is about 563K. So the, law, the marsh saved about 15.1% of the loss. Now, if we include all the buildings of 500 some buildings there, and the loss is 11.9 million. And this uh, compares with 12.8 million when we don't have the wetland there, therefore we avoided $902,000 and saved the marsh saved 7.6% of the damage. And so PWRC report estimated total loss about 20 million compared to our with about 12 million. And their loss includes buildings, docks and marinas, which we do not include in our study. So now if you want to estimate the value of marsh per square kilometer, or square meter, the marsh is about uh, 1.05 kilometers square. And so it, it boils down to about 86 cents per square meter. That's, but this number is gonna change. So the interesting thing is how does it change in 21st century, All right? So this is what uh, we're, we're gonna go into. Uh, so the details of the Pyramon st study was in the paper in Publishing environmental research letters. Again, it's also, this was in late March. And you see, we have uh, interdisciplinary team involved. Uh, so you can go there to read more detail. But today we want to uh, talk about the future. And here's the storm ensemble predicted by Tim Hall. And I don't know if Tim is on, but uh, I was hoping Tim can say a few words about this. Tim, are you there? I guess not. Uh, yes, someone oh. asked me a question. Tim, are you? Um, oh, I was just about to say that uh, there appears to be a, a question in the chat from Vivian. Um, okay. But you were just about to answer that. Sorry for interrupting. Yeah, someone asked me a question if the building, different types of buildings are taken into account. Yes, the buildings are taken into account. Uh, we even, uh, I'll get into that, the details of the building, but this is a nice uh, ensemble of hurricane track and produced by, by Tim. And we actually did some checking. We run, we produce a 1% flood map using these and compare it with the FEMA map information from compared with the Army Corps flood elevation. And I'll have some numbers to show you. This is a really good set of storms and we compare with all the historic storms and they compare really well. Uh, so this is really good, useful information that we, uh, so some reason, okay. Now, Tim Hall estimates Sandy is a 700 year storm. All right, so this ensemble includes many storms which come in different intensity sizes and speeds and with winds from very different directions and landfall location uh, from Sandy. Uh, you know, to uh, help coast communities to do coastal resilience planning, we have to tell them the impact of these whole ensemble storms, not just one single Sandy storm. And that's what the communities want. So each storm generates different flood and wave along the New Jersey coast and the village. And some storm with southwest southeasterly wind and they flow parallel to the marsh. Therefore, flood can be more buffered by marsh. Other storms, it buffers more wave, less flood, and some storms buffer both. So we include everything. Uh, 
hundreds of storms. And so how do we come up with this 1% annual chance storm? So we simulate these 300 uh, optimal storms. But these 300 storms actually represent 20,256 storms. Okay, we had a paper in 2019, which explained that, that we can do 300 storms and which represent possible all possible storms for a particular region. And so how do we come up with 1% flood and wave? Now, there are hundreds of storms. They'll come up with uh, elevation that exceeds the annual chance flood. Uh, and therefore, um, we need to consider all those storms. Those storms have very low frequency we add up all those frequency, they're equal to 1%. So that, that is how this 1% flat elevation is defined and 1% wave is defined the same way. So, uh, and so how do we do the restoration stuff? And so the resource manager, they propose a 40 acre plan uh, between 2020 and 2025. Uh, in this five years, they will first start with region one on the lower left corner and uh, remove the Phragmites. And then assuming they're successful, they replace them with Typha. Then they'll work on region two, remove that uh, Phragmites and then grow Typha. And, and then they do the same thing on, on region three. And, Ideally, if they're successful, that in five years, this whole area would become completely typhoid. But there was a proposal, there's a lot of idealization, whether it will work or may happen or not, I don't know. Uh, this is a hypothetical marsh management area replaced by typhoid in phases. And so you may not believe me if the 300 storm can represent all possible uh, 20,000 storms. So I, I gave you a little brief summary. And so here's actually, this is for Southwest Florida, but I, I'm using this to make the point. We have to probably the density function for central pressure deficit, for the radius maximum wind, forward speed, storm heading, and landfall location. They're all probabilistic there. Each has its probability density function. But we can't. We we have to consider all possible storms by looking at the ideally the continuous probability density function. But we can't do the uh, continuous function. We have to discretize them. We discre discretize them, and each one discretize into five bins: one, two, three, four, five, five to the six power. It's twenty thousand two hundred fifty-six storms represent all possible storms. Uh, but we show that in the 2019 paper, we show that 300 storm will do the job. So you don't need to run the 3D model or 2D model that 20,000 times. So let's take a, take, take a look at, let's say battery. We check at battery, the total of 250 storms were found to be in the groups group of storms which yielded the 1% elevation of 12.9 feet. And the storm rate in the group of storms range from 0.00000451 to 0.00012911 with an average storm rate of, of this, which is basically the 1% divided by 258. So, so total, these all these storms come up with elevation more than 12.9 feet at battery. So their total rate added up is 1%, okay? And of course, this, this number is very dependent on the storm ensemble. So as the storm become more intense, it's 1% storm elevation is gonna be higher. So let's see how it compares with the 12.9 feet compared with the FEMA. FEMA is 14. Why is FEMA 14? FEMA numbers are always in round numbers. Because you ever, if you ever look at the FEMA maps, 
they, they do contour lines. These contour lines are drawn by hand subjectively. And um, therefore they run everything off. Sometimes the two adjacent contour lines could be different by, by two feet. So therefore our numbers, our numbers are exact. Uh, we don't have round off numbers. And so we are within 1.5 feet from the FEMA elevation. So these are quite, quite good. And FEMA does their own study. They use different storm ensemble, use a different model, but they are pretty close, okay? So we're generally a little bit lower. Now, Army Corps has their own method. They use Monte Carlo simulation. They don't use the joint probability method with optimal sampling. And their numbers are 25 to 50% lower for the same location. Connecticut, New York, New Jersey. Uh, what are you doing with this? Well, they're doing lots of flood mitigation studies up and down the coast. I hope they're using our number or FEMA number instead of their lower number because they're gonna be building flood walls with these numbers, okay? Anyway, that's that. I sidetracked a little bit. So we have to do scenario simulations for Piermont Marsh. We design uh, six scenarios from 2020, 2020 to 2025, mostly is to address the marsh, uh, marsh uh, restoration. So like area one, area two, area three, starting 2020, we removed the marsh in area one. So there's no marsh and other area uh, CC current climate. Okay, existing condition. By 2022, we hope area one had low typha. Area two has no marsh, it got removed. Area three is Sphagnites current condition. If it's successful, 2025, we have high typha in area one, low typha area two, no marsh in, in area three. By 2050, all everything is good, high typha. And we also do 2050 with current condition. Uh, and then we do 2100. Now, using the sea level rise of different values, so these are numbers that I got from clouds from NPCC numbers, six inches for 2025, 18 inches for 2050, 114 inches in 2100, extremely high value under this extremely high value uh, Nava Kabak estimated that the marsh will be completely inundated and lost. So we want to simulate the Piermont Marsh uh, role in protect flood damage to the village under these scenarios, six scenarios that account for sea level rise, marsh restoration, as well as of course the storm ensemble is included in all these simulations. Why do we not include more intense storms According to Tim's latest estimate, he got, I set him a set up camp 5.3 uh, predictions of uh, future storms in 21st century. And he used his NASA model and showed me that uh, surprisingly enough that the storm conditions in 2100 is not gonna create flood conditions that are much different from uh, 2020 conditions. So uh, the storm ensemble is the same for these six scenarios. So this is the figure that I got from Klaus and PCC. Uh, so 2050, we use the median value of 18 inches here, but for 2100, we use the 100 percentile of 114 inches. And so you got any question, you can ask Klaus afterwards. Uh, so here are the results. We did simulation of these 1% flood, 1% wave. Uh, this is 2050, so 2020 to 2050, significant increase in the flood elevation. Uh, this is in feet because communities uh, likes to see feet. I got convert them to meters when I write papers. Uh, and so here's the 18 
20, 18 inch sea level rise uh, wave height. So notice that the flood elevation is quite uniform across this marsh all the way to the uh, village southern boundary clouds house. But the wave height, you see the wave height is dissipated very quickly within a couple hundred meters. Uh, well, and so it's going to dissipate by two thirds by the time it gets to cloud cells, and both now and 2050. And this is from a uh, Tabak study. Uh, she used a slant model looking at the fate of the marsh under stabilized scenarios and different accretion conditions. Uh, she, and here, what we plotted is the under high sea level and low accretion condition. By 2100, uh, the marsh is completely uh, lost. It's basically, it's not there anymore, except a little bit here. Uh, however, so this is the worst case condition we simulated, okay? Scenario six, we have one worst condition corresponding to this. Marsh is all lost. We also have a marsh, uh, the best condition which corresponding to this, the three generic accretion rate uh, for Piermont Marsh that uh, used in Tabaka study. The high accretion rate uh, here, if we use 10 to 12 millimeter per year, then in the eight, next 80 years by 2100, we're gonna have a one meter accretion. Uh, which is uh, possible. Uh, why is that possible? Because availability of sediments, there's a lot of effort to uh, apply thin layer uh, uh, placement sediments over the entire Piedmont Marsh. There's a lot of monitoring studies going on. And also we, I have uh, simulated uh, a developed model for sediment deposition and um, uh, we found that turbulence behind these uh, phragmites due to the increased uh, turbulence wake. There, there's more mixing and causing faster deposition to the ground. And also because the large leaf area index of phragmites provides compared to, to typha. And, and Judy Weiss recently led a study for the New Jersey uh, D, uh, Department of Environmental Protection, and she built a very nice report. And they found that Phragmites produce more litter on the surface and this litter decays more slowly and therefore traps more sediments for a longer time. And they compare uh, the different types of marshes along the entire New Jersey coast. And she found that the only marsh that could sustain sea level rise, catch up with sea level rise was Phragmite Marsh. And it's, it's a, she's working on a paper on that. So we feel that the best case scenario uh, needs to be looked at as well. So this is a very busy table. Let me explain to you. On the left, we have different scenarios. These are the scenarios we've done before, Sandy, Black Swan, 1%. Event, 1% uh, uh, event, event is not a good word because it's a really a 1% flood and wave. Uh, but these are the conditions that we have simulated. Uh, these are the total structural loss in million dollars. So, so in, during Sandy, we had $11.93 million loss, current condition without, uh, with the marsh. But when we remove the marsh, none, the loss increased to 12.83 million. Uh, and here, this is relative structure loss percent. And total avoided loss, okay? This is the difference between this and that, 0 0.9 million. Relative avoid avoided loss, 7.56%. So these are all different metrics that you can use to describe the value of a wetland. You see this in different studies. You can't just go with one metric 
And so we feel best to show all these numbers here. And we also need to look at the flooded marsh area that Sandy was 1.05 kilometers squared. So if we divide the total avoided loss by the flooded marsh, we come up with the 85 cents per square meter. Here is what I call unit marsh value for Piermont Marsh, all right? Now, if we do the same thing for New Jersey, uh, county by county, and we got a median value of 0.15, 15 cents per meter square. So which marsh was more effective in flood protection? Obviously, Piermont Marsh, right, for Sandy, but that's not the entire story. In the Black Swan uh, storm, the unit marsh value of a Piermont was only 24 cents because it was a design to create maximum damage there. New Jersey was very relatively light, so the damage was little, and this value was $5.9. Uh, so the 1% flood uh, unit marsh value was $2.09 in Piermont Marsh. Uh, because with and without the marsh, the difference is about 2.2 million divided by one kilometer square is give you $2 uh, per square meter. By 2050, when it's fully restored, the value of the marsh is calculated at $3.4. So how can the marsh become more valuable by 2050? Well, the answer is that the avoided loss is increased because the loss without the marsh would have been much higher, it would be 31 million without a marsh. Therefore, the increase, the total avoided loss, therefore the value of the marsh is higher in 2050, despite the 18 inch sea level rise. Now let's look at the 2100, the worst case scenario, marsh is completely gone. Therefore, the value is nothing. That's assuming the prediction, the marsh is completely inundated and there's no marsh at all. But if we use the best scenario, which I best case scenario, which I mentioned, which could happen if the Phragmites marsh uh, can keep up with sea level rise because the sedimentation, because the continued growth and uh, everybody knows Phragmites grow much better, much faster than Typha uh, under very adverse conditions. In that case, the marsh will retain $2.79 per square meter. Now, compared to the median value of New Jersey, I'm not gonna go into the detail how we did this New Jersey. This is per county value. Per county, the median value for county is $4.82 uh, per meter square. And the reason it's higher because New Jersey has a lot of uh, wooded wetlands, not just the Typha marsh because uh, the Typha Marsh by 2100 are probably not there anymore. Uh, so that is uh, uh, a lot of the stuff that I want to stuff I want to go over. And, and we also created created this tool for just for the village people, the stakeholders, and it's got a lot of sensitive information for every scenario. We got the percent of property damage. Uh, we actually originally have the value of damage, but they want to see the percent is less sensitive. Originally we had for every text parcel, but they want to be aggregated into pen, uh, hexagon, not pentagons. Okay, uh, so that it's a, it's a block. Number of houses, not in individual houses. And so these uh, tool is provided to the community for Resiliency uh, planning. Uh, okay. So this is the summary. Piermont Marsh buffered wave current debris during Sandy, uh, but not much surge and, and flood. Uh, Phragmites are uh, very effective. They will remain effective in 21st century. New Jersey, New Jersey wellands are more valuable because higher property values. And important message, evaluation of coastal marsh for flood protection requires integration of 
dynamic model simulations of storm ensembles with extensive data, including uh, building data, flood data, uh, loss data from FEMA over regional and local scales. We also need the first floor elevation of every single building in, in the locality. And you simply cannot derive meaningful evaluation of coastal wetland using linear regression model. I've seen, I've seen several examples of that. Uh, linear regression models simply cannot work. Uh, there's a recently a paper published in Proceedings for National Academy of Science. It gives a national scale wetland value. It's grossly overestimated by order of magnitude. Uh, there's no dynamic model simulation. It's all linear regression, historic data. They don't separate the flood damage from the wind damage. And so it's a very impressive looking paper, but unfortunately it's not robust. So important thing message is to we need to do sediment supply, prevent marsh edge erosion. So that concludes my talk and Thank you for your patience and attention. I'll be happy to take questions. Uh, thank you very much, Peter, for a fascinating talk. I should get some uh, hand clapping or something. It would be very appropriate. Sort of, yay. Uh, sorry, I'm good. Um, so we have a question in the chat from Peter, uh, not Peter, uh, Philip, sorry. Uh, Dor Dor Dorothy is clapping. Very good. Uh, Philip, would you mind uh, unmuting? Could you ask? Sure. Thank you. I, I, hey, Peter, how's it going? Good to sure. see you. Good to see your presentation again. Um, <clears throat> um, I was just wondering if you had the computational, you know, the time to simulate all the storms for these different marsh and no marsh scenarios, because you've got this full, you're basically one step short, although it's a really expensive step. If you could simulate all your storms, then you have the full probability distribution, and then you can get your annualized benefit for any storm instead of just for Sandy or, and you know what I'm talking about, because I think you've done it before. Yeah, yeah. Do, you, do you have time we, to do that? Well, we have simulated all 300 storms for your region, okay? So uh, you, you recall that I, uh, last year I published a paper on the rapid forecasting system for Florida. So what we did there is we used the optimal storms, 300 storms. From there, we create a forecasting system. We can uh, create a database. So where you, you, you give it one track, any track, it will give you a flood and wave, maximum flood and wave map for that one particular storm. So we have that system for Florida and we could do the same thing for New Jersey, New York area. So you give me any track put into that database, it will give you the maximum flood and, and wave height for the entire region. And there, then you, if you plug in that regression model we developed, uh, you can estimate, you can predict uh, what the loss is gonna be in that particular zip code, in every zip code in that region, so yes. But we haven't done that for your region yet, but it could be done, yeah. Did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, I mean, and I guess the broader point is, it's really, it's a big step forward to be where you can give the, the benefit of a marsh for Sandy or for the 1% chance storm. But then, yeah, based on everything you've already done and you, you're capable of doing, you could even take it one step further with a bunch of comp, you know, model simulations and do all the storms and then give the total benefit per year for Mars from any storm, right? And, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. And, okay, wait, and, wait, and wait. do a cost benefit analysis, right? I mean, you're, you're one sort of big step short of doing that. You've got all the tools and then, and then you can compute the cost benefit analysis of Mars, basically. Well, right? we, we, we have done that. So the 300 storm actually represents all possible storm. Every single storm yeah. is captured by that. And so, so therefore you look at the 1%, the effect of wet, wetland on the 1% flood and wave and damage, it captures the, the effect of marsh 
on all storms, all possible storms. They're, they're, we're not missing any step. But if you want to do forecasting, yes, uh, we are missing that one step in New Jersey, New York. But we have done that for Florida. So we have a rapid forecasting system. So you give me any track, I'll tell you how much damage is going to happen in every zip code. Because I know the zip, I know the well and everywhere. Okay, so we, we just need that one step for your region, then we are in good shape. We can do forecast. We can forecast the damage in every zip code. We, we just need to do one step, which wouldn't be too hard to do. But, but I like to do one more thing because the New Jersey, New York stuff is done with 2D model. I'm not happy with it because uh, you can't really resolve the change in the structure, vertical structure. I like to see that the marshes and wooded wetland get sampled. We get the full structure distribution. So we put in our 3D model. We'll redo the stuff in 3D and then create this forecasting system. Then you can do it for any, any storm. You can do planning with that. It can be done. If you can convince your people in New Jersey DEP to monitor all the marshes and wetland, that would be great. Can you do that? No taker. Uh, okay. Uh, do we have any uh, further questions or comments? So uh, perhaps Alan is unmuted, maybe he would like to say something. Well, I have a comment which is more on politics than on science. We had yesterday a meeting of the planning board <clears throat> where they <clears throat> made the first step, not the final, uh, towards allowing a house to be built right on Spark Hill where you had all your red dots Okay, mm -hmm. meaning um, these are the highest uh, percentage loss values. Uh, now, that is for the uh, map that we showed, of course, is for existing structures. Mm -hmm. uh, while this proposed structure will have its first floor elevation 14 feet above ground. Um, but it's interesting that um, your map, for instance, uh, does not enter into political decision making. <laughs> I'm not a, uh, I'm not a politician. <laughs> uh, well, right. So, so my map. <clears throat> But it's interesting uh, <clears throat> you mentioned that because uh, we're doing quite a bit of studies in Florida counties. I got a couple of projects on uh, Collier County, Florida, and one on Pinellas County. In Pinellas County, we produce the future flood maps for the county. Uh, we, we use the storm ensemble created by Nation, also Tim Hall's storm ensemble. It works very well for Florida as well. So, uh, uh, and uh, the county people really like it. And they look at our map and versus the FEMA map. And in that case, they found our numbers are generally a little bit higher. And I think the difference is because we use a, a, a larger ensemble, which is more representative of the area than what the ensemble FEMA used. And so the county people uh, talk to their commissioner. They want, to, uh, they, they want the county commissioners to agree that our map represents the best practice flood mm -hmm. map, best science-based flood map. And the commissioners agree, and the only pushback is from the developers, okay? Developers who want to develop housing, beach properties, they're the only one who rejected 
but and the real estate agencies actually real estate business they actually prefer the higher elevations from our study mm -hmm. so it's very consistent to what you're saying developers uh they don't want to hear this um but they know it's out there and and the same thing with collier county there's a lot of development going on right now it's all on the other side of the i-75 which is on the higher ground i don't know if it's because they look at the maps we produce for for the county because the uh, coastal areas don't don't look very promising I wonder who's insuring these properties. Insurance? Uh, well, okay. Uh, f flood insurance is a, is a very interesting business. Uh, uh, NFIP is the, is the default uh, flood insurance agency. Everybody has to buy uh, flood insurance through FEMA. Uh, but, you know, it's heavily subsidized. Actually, it's a real good bargain if you live on the coast because uh, you can... You can build a house and get this destroyed and rebuilt. FEMA will continue to pay up to $250,000 a year or, or event. Uh, private companies are charging more because if you have business, you want to insure more than 250,000, you have to buy private insurance. Okay. Do they want to use our maps? Uh, probably not uh, because uh, um, in South Florida, we, we, we calculate with the future storm gets more intense, uh, the flood vulnerability can increase three, four, five times. And uh, so those are the difficult choices, you know. But is it the government ultimately paying for some of these for decisions in terms of allowing people to build the places so they can be carried on? Yeah, well, FEMA flood insurance, everybody knows it's bankrupt, it's unsustainable. So every year Congress said, yeah, we want to increase the flood insurance rate to a more realistic level. But then some other congressmen step up, say we want to protect the poor people who live on the coast who can't afford a high insurance cost. <laughs> so it's never gonna work unless become privatized, become re realistic uh, risk uh, gets communicated to the coastal community because unless that happens, we're all subsidizing people who are living on the coast, uh, which is a, it's a real bargain right now if you want to live on the coast. Charles has his hand up. Well, uh, that was the case in the past, but the projections of the rates, uh, instead of raising a, a single step, FEMA and Congress decided to raise it over a 10 year period every year. And once the 10 years are over, some people pay five to eight times more than they do uh, at the beginning of this raising period, which was two or three years ago. So there will be a bitter awakening as to how much uh, the uh, costs to a homeowner are from flood insurance in some cases, they may be exceeding what they pay for their mortgages. Exactly, exactly, yep. Yep, so we, we are at a point where we can calculate the, uh, with, with, with the more and more accurate predictions from climate models and sea level rise models, we will be able to make more accurate assessment of the exact risk of every single tax parcel along the coast However, there is still some uh, work needs to be done. That, that is, uh, uh, there is quite a bit of uncertainty in the future storms calculated by these climate models. Uh, the, you know, these climate models have very large grid uh, resolution. And, and also because of the low resolution, it doesn't necessarily capture all the convective processes, which, which is uh, contribute to the hurricanes very well. Uh, there's total 60 CMIP-5 climate models. And so you need to do comparison of climate models and the downscaling models. There's more than one downscaling method. There's uh, uh, Tim's uh, nation model. There is Emmanuel Carey's model. Uh, 
And there are other models. WORF has been used for downscaling as well. I've seen one or two papers using one downscaling model and about four climate models and uh, looking at their prediction on future storms. That is not enough. There's so much uncertainty. We, there's so much we don't know. We, we don't know what we don't know. What I'm saying is, you know, how much uncertainty is there from these future storms predicted by these climate models? We don't really know. So that's the big uncertainty. It's, it's like the sea level rise. When is this glacier, you know, when is the Antarctica ice melt is going to hit us? When is going to be the trigger point? We don't know exactly with 2070 or 2090. So it, it, towards the end of 21st century, we don't know, but we have to plan 30 years, 50 years, because that's what the lifespan of infrastructure is. And even then, the uncertainty is, is pretty high. So I like to see more connection between people doing storm prediction using climate models, sea level rise predictions, because they look at larger scale, but we have to work with local scale, very high resolution. Somewhere these two scales, there is a gap, there is a mismatch. And I like to work with those people on the larger scale to fill that gap. And there's a lot more work needs to be done. We've, we've done some work here, but there is uncertainty in, 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 the, in the results here. But I'm saying optimistically, the marshes will be able to continue to have value for flood protection, but exactly how much value we need to nail down the uncertainty more. So I, I like to, to see more advancements in, in the climate modeling, zero science predictions, as well as you know, working with them on the coastal side. Thank you. That, that was a great, uh, perhaps, ending summary and comment. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Uh, are there any other questions? I just noticed we're about 15 minutes over our time here. Um, what we let you get on? Any questions, comments? Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thanks so much. Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Um, I look forward to adding this to the, to the YouTube archive. And I hope you guys have a, a great rest of the day. Thank you, you too. Bye. Yeah. Um,